Natural Radio with David Diamante. We are in Nottingham, England. We have a massive fight this weekend with Lee Wood and Mauricio Lara uh, vying for the WBA Featherweight Championship of the World. And it's a stacked card. And our guest today is a very exciting fighter. And he's he's no stranger to Nottingham because he, I think you made your matchroom debut here, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Did I'm with Gary the Diva Cully. He's an undefeated lightweight. He packs that punch. He's a southpaw. He's super exciting and he's quickly becoming a fan favorite. Gary, great to see you, my friend. Yeah, thank you, man. Um, great to be here. Great to be back in Nottingham, like you said. Uh, just about a year ago since I had my matchroom debut here against Miguel Vasquez. And um, love the city, love the vibes here. It's obviously good memories for me, so I'm excited to be back and excited to be performing again this weekend. Well, that night was a really special night, obviously, because that was the, turned out to be the fight of the year yeah. with Mick Conlon and Lee Wood, um, fellow countryman, and also a friend of yours. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I want to talk about Mick in just a little bit, but that night, obviously, there was a massive contingency of, of Irish. Irish, yeah, yeah. And obviously, there will be t t tomorrow night also, but maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? Did you actually did you actually go out after your fight? Because first of all, when you fought Vasquez, former world champ, former IVF world champ, which was a big step up for you. A lot of people saying that that fight was was too early for you. Yeah. Um. And I think he had a lot of defenses, maybe eight defenses, something like that. So proper he, world champ. He'd held the title for four years, maybe a little bit over four years. So he was he was a legit world champion. You know. Um. He'd been in the UK before. Beat Ritson. Um, was on the wrong end of a bad decision, close fight with Harry Davis, could it be him too? And a lot of people were kind of, yeah, they, thinking it was a step too soon for me. Um, but it was my coming out party and that's what I, I used that camp as and that, that was my motivation for that camp was this is my coming out party and I proved that in the performance as well. Um, and since then kicked on, but yeah, like you said about, about Nottingham, uh, it, boxing's a bit of a mad game because I was here last year and not that I was against Lee, but I was with Mick. Mick's, uh, I've grown up around Mick, watching him in the amateurs, training with him in the amateurs, and uh, I was rooting for Mick that week. And now I'm over here and I'm, I'm rooting for Lee and I'm, I'm Team Lee Wood this week. So boxing's in my game. It's nothing personal, obviously. It's always business, but uh, it's mad how the, how the tables turn and how the tides change. And uh, I'm back here now as a, as a Lee Wood fan this week, so it's cool. It's really hard for me. Boxing is a mad game. You know, I try to never root for any fighter because I, I root for all you guys. Mm -hmm. um, even your opponent this this weekend, I've known him for years. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's a kid from Puerto Rico, but he fights out of Dunkirk, New yep. York. And I did a fight for him probably five years ago in Louisville, Kentucky. And he, first round knockout. Um, great guy. I know his team and nice people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, and obviously I'm a big fan of yours. Of course. I just, you know, I want you both to stay safe. May the best man win, but it is a mad game like that. Did you get to see that fight the night after you? Did you come back out to the arena? Best boy I'd ever seen live. And sometimes, so did. yeah, 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 I did. I did. Um, Unreal. Sometimes I don't stick around because I get the business done and, and I'm on a high. So it's kind of like I just get back to the hotel and chill with my team and, and kind of debrief and, and chat about the night. But uh, obviously, like I said, it was a big fight. It was a world title fight. Irish guy fighting one of my teammates from back in the day and one of my close friends. So uh, I stuck around and thankfully I did because like you said, it turned out to be fight of the year and uh, like I said, best best fight I've ever witnessed live. So yeah. So Mick Conlon, I just want to stay on Mick just for a second because obviously he had the situation in Rio mm -hmm. with the Olympics and uh, you lost your fight to John... John was a John Oliver Joyce, David Oliver Joyce. Da I'm sorry, David Oliver Joyce, um, which kind of I guess stopped that. But you were kind of disillusioned with the Olympics because of that. Is that? You yeah, that yeah. Like uh, my goal was my goal when I started out boxing was always to to eventually turn professional, and I would have grown up watching Mayweather and Prince Nassim, and that's always the the route I wanted to go. But obviously, as I grew up and got a little bit better, um won a couple of titles, people started mentioning Olympics and I seen the Olympics as a dream then and, and that became a goal of mine. Um, but purely just to get a better offer, get a better deal when I was turning into the pros. Um, but that was a big goal of mine. Won a European gold in 2013 in the U Championships and uh, I was on course to, to qualify for the Olympics, I thought, and fought David Oliver Joyce. 
close fight in the national championships that day we got 3-2 split decision um, was a little bit disheartened by the decision thought I did enough to win but in these fights that are close it can go either way um, I was brought into squad training then to, to train with the guys in the lead up to the Olympics and doing a lot of sparring with Mick and seeing how he prepared not only first for the world championships which he won gold in and then going out to the Olympics to what he thought he was going to win gold in again and I thought he was going to win gold in and to see the to see the decision that was given against him then it kind of turned me away from from amateur boxing. I've, I've also been to to tournaments in the past, maybe in uh, in Russia or some of these countries in, in Europe that I've seen fighters lose five fights in a row and win a gold medal, you know, that I thought they lost five fights in a row. Like it was really, really corrupt at the time and uh, I kind of got a little bit of sand and um, like I said, my goal was always to go professional. So I kept training for, it was probably about six or eight months um, and then decided the time was right for me to go professional and, and not wait around to try and qu qualify for our Tokyo. So. But you had a lot of great accolades as an amateur, like you said, European gold, which I saw that the NACE um, gave you that kind of placard. Yeah, it yeah. Was, it felt really good. It was really good. Um, at the time, I probably didn't appreciate it as much as I should have because <laughs> I was 16, 17, and all these cameras being put in your face, and I was a little bit shy at the time. Um, no more, huh? No more. No I'm more. settling into the role now. Yeah? Ladies and I'm, gentlemen, no more. I'm doing quite well. The diva, one, right, the the diva. diva is well and truly here now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was a little bit shy at the time and uh, got thrown. There's actually a clip on YouTube um, of when I came back from the European Championships. I was 17 at the time and uh, a local like newspaper YouTube channel came up and did a piece on me and they did a little interview and I look back on it now with my missus and I kind of cringe a little bit from it. But uh I'm thankful for it because it's I'm, I'm well able to sit in front of a camera now and speak to you or do interviews. I always get like compliments that I speak very well in front of a camera, so I'm I'm grateful for that now. But back then, like I said, I was uh, just a 17 year old kid and the camera was thrown in front of my face. But look, it's it's cool. Um, nice is a small town. Everybody knows everybody, and uh, they made a big deal of it for me and they support me. They have supported me throughout my amateur career and are continuing to support me in prof professional career. So uh, yeah, man, it makes me proud. A little Southwest from Dublin there, Nace, and uh, also six-time amateur national champion, Herringay Box Cup. Yeah, prestigious, prestigious. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Um, let's talk a little bit about Nace and growing up. Um, it's been documented, you know, there's been some family issues mm -hmm. uh, with your with your dad and with your mom also. Um, and uh, rest in peace, you know, I know your dad's passed. Thank you, yeah, appreciate that. Absolutely. And you went into the gym, how old were you? Was it seven? I would have been seven starting. Seven. Yeah, yeah, first day. Can, can you talk about how you first? Because you were into football. You like you you liked uh, playing soccer. Yeah, I used to play football. I used to. I was quite athletic. I played every every sport. Um, I used to run cross country. Not obviously not at seven, but going through uh, secondary school and and stuff like that. I used to run cross country as well. But I have a brother who's two years older than me, and we would have grown up watching boxing. Um, my dad was into boxing. Boxing was on the TV all the time. So we would have grown up like. WWE was big in our house as well. We were big fans of that and we would have been wrestling and, and boxing and fighting and just growing up fighting. And then he went to the boxing club. He joined the boxing club at whatever age. He would have been nine maybe. Um, went down and obviously a big, my big brother who I spent all my time with was gone for two hours twice a week. So I started questioning where is he gone? My mom wouldn't tell me at the time and uh, because I was too young. They said, "Isn't it eight? You're supposed to. You're supposed eight. to be eight, yeah. So <laughs> the, legally, so they were. They saying, just kind of bend the rules a bit, or so she. Did you come up with the, the fake idea? She knew the coach personally, <laughs> thankfully enough, and brought me down. It was in the parish hall in Nice, and uh, he just said, "Look, leave him there if he wants to. If he wants, there was like we shared, but like uh, there was toys in the corner from like kids, kids, uh, different classes and stuff that would have been on their kids groups and stuff. If he wants to just like go down and play with the toys in the back or whatever, like we'll just we'll just leave him here. But I was just." hitting the bags and uh, I remember the guys had to, they were they were a good bit older than me at the time so they had to put their groin guards on when I was sparring them and I'd be hitting them in the groin guards because they were so big like. <laughs> um, so that was early days, that was seven. Um, and then just grew up, um, had my first, obviously you can't compete in Ireland, like you can't, uh, yeah, it, it's all spars or exhibitions until you're 11 and then um, started fighting the national championships. Everybody was like, this guy's a natural, he's gonna win his first first year and banged on national title. Um got to the final, lost in the final the first year. 
went back, rebuilt, got to the final the second year, I lost in the, sec in the second year as in the Nationals as well. Um, rebuilt, getting a little bit deflated at that time, rebuilt. This, these years I was winning Kildare titles, Leinster titles to qualify for the Nationals, getting to the National Final, lost. Um, third time, got to the National Final, lost. And uh, was probably, probably close to going, right, I'm going to give this one more year. If I don't get this National Title, like I need to start thinking about it because I'm a winner and I've got a winner's mentality. Um, so I changed things up a little bit, gave boxing more time. And in the fourth year then, my boy four, we call it in Ireland, I would have been 14, won my first National Title. Then went on, won my youth, won, won my youths under 18s, qualified for the European Championships, won goal out there. And once I got, broke the duck, um, I went on and just, just couldn't lose then, you know? Let's talk about this winner's mentality. Describe it for us and where did it come from? Yeah, it's probably why I get the name Diva um, because I'm very, very competitive. I set standards in the gym. Where we train in, I train in the gym in Nace that my best friend Noel runs. Um, and we're very, very competitive and we do things to a certain standard. And if somebody comes into the gym and cuts a corner to come first, I'm, I'm on them. Um, you can come in and you can challenge us, but if you're going to beat me and you're going to come first in this run, you're not going to fuck cut that corner. Um, you're going to come in and you're going to earn your win. So um, I'm, I'm high on standards. I set high standards. I push myself as hard as I can push myself in the gym. I work very, very hard, and that's where all my successes come from. So that's why I have that winner, winner's mentality because I've seen that if we can compete at a high level, if we're we're running 5Ks in the gym, like Niall, Niall has, has started me on 5Ks maybe six, seven years ago now, trying to do 20 minute 5Ks. And now we're down to like beating each other by five seconds to do like 15 30s and 16, like 33 minute uh, 10Ks and stuff. So we're always trying to gain that edge. Um, and I believe that that's what it takes at the top level is these details, you know. So that's why I put so much time into working hard. Um, and trying to win and compete with guys who are working at high level also because it pushes everybody on. And I don't want to just go up by myself, I want to bring everybody on as well. So that's why I have that winner's mentality. I want people to to challenge me, to try and beat me, so then we can we can work hard together and we can grow together and we can all come up, you know? But where does that fire and that drive, where do you think that comes from? Does it come from the stuff that you went through as a child, the stuff that you witnessed in your house or in the streets, or is it just always been in you? I think like I always go back to this thing that I seen like I'm big on I'm quite spiritual guy. Um but I seen this fight maybe when I was five, six years old on the T V and it was like all the bright lights and the razzle dazzle in, in Vegas. I don't know what, exactly what fight it was, but I would have seen it on the T V and just looked at them and that's gonna be me one day and when I joined boxing then, everybody started saying, this kid's a natural. And then it, it kind of fed my head a little bit more and I put more time into it and realized that I was good. Um, started winning titles then and all this success started coming to me. And the more and more time went on and the more and more hard work I put in, the closer I start coming to these goals. And, and then I obviously turned professional and I'm not far off achieving these dreams that I've had now. So I always look back and say, I'm about to pr prove that five-year-old right. So I believe that my belief comes from, from a higher power, a higher purpose, and I was built for this, I was made for this, it's my destiny to be great. Um, and I just look back at it and like, that five-year-old kid, 22 years ago, he knew that, Like you know what I mean? So um, every time I get a win, I'm like, nah, he knew that. So keep believing in yourself when you were a five-year-old kid and, and prove yourself right. And uh, that's why I work so hard as well, because I've come this far and I haven't only come this far to come this far, you know? It's, it's a cliche what a lot of people say, but I've come very, very far. Um, I've come a long way, and I want to prove that that little kid right. Yeah, so that's where it's that's where it's stemming from is that five year old kid having a little, a little dream, a little look at the TV and go, yeah, that can be me, and I'm coming closer to it. So uh, I want to prove him right. And you even have, I guess, some Polaroids of the belt hanging in your rearview mirror. Yeah. In your car. Yeah. To kind of visualize what you're going to get, what you want. 100% and I've been big on that since probably since I'm like 14, 15 years of age um, I remember my mom reading The Secret and talking about the law of attraction and stuff and I don't know why but I bought into it at the time and uh, it started working for me and we'll come back to, to changing rooms after fights and I use flotation therapy a lot, sensory deprivation tanks um, 
in a place in nice and I use it a lot for visualization and I'll see fights and I'll see things that I think can happen and that will happen and we've come back to change rooms in the past after these like crazy performances and first round knockouts and and people say that's that's crazy that that's just happened and I'm like no you don't realize how crazy that is because I've actually seen that exact thing happen in eight weeks ago and I've believe that that's going to happen. I've worked whatever shot it may be. It's a straight one, two. I've worked that shot for the last eight weeks in the gym. That's the shot that landed. That's the shot that knocked him out. I've actually seen that. You think it's crazy, but you've only seen the 10 minutes in the ring or whatever whatever amount of time in the ring, my ring walk and my performance. But I've seen this for the last eight weeks. I've went to sleep thinking about this. I've woke up thinking about this. I've been in deprivation, sleep, sensory deprivation tanks thinking about this. And it comes true every time, like, and it's 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 uh, it's real life magic. That's what I call it. It's real life magic, and and magic's not real unless you believe in it. And I, I really do believe in it, and it's been working for me. So, um, I, I'm big on it. Yeah. Are you a natural southpaw? Yeah, I'm left-handed. You've always been left-handed. Always been left-handed, and always since I've been nine years of age, people have been talking about my left hand. This this magic oh, dynamite left, left hand, you know. Your left hand's pretty it's, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's several opponents I could ask about it. Um, people they I might mean, not remember. <laughs> yeah. And they can go back to the tape. And they can see it. Special. Yeah. But let me ask you this, though, because that's, it, it, you know, as much as that is um, an attribute, of course it is, right, it can also be a detriment. And you know what I'm saying, because if you fall in love with your power, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And especially a guy like you, you've got, you know, 15 fights, a lot of them have been knockouts. So how, you know, sometimes you don't get to do all those rounds. You don't get that experience yeah. because you're knocking people out. Mm. And I know you're always out there trying to take somebody's head off. But you also know in this game, there's some just savages out there. And the screws only tighten box. Of course. So, you know, there are levels to it. Mm -hmm. You fought some really good opponents, but it, the screws are going to tighten. For sure. Or is that a concern for you that maybe you haven't banked those rounds that you're going to need to go against some of these fellas? I've built my amateur career on, I was like, I didn't have this power as an amateur. So I was big on, on skills, pay the bills as an amateur. And, and I was tall, lean, but admittedly quite weak as an amateur. And I would have been dubbed as uh, by the Irish high performance coach Zor Antia as the perfect amateur he used to call me um, because I worked so hard on technique and stuff so for me I was always like a long distance boxer boxing on the back foot skills pay the bills and I actually haven't got to show that yet and I believe that I'm one of the best conditioned fighters in the world and um, we work uh, we put a lot of hard work and a lot of time a lot of energy into into being well conditioned and to be able to fight for 10 and 12 rounds in championship fights and um, I actually get a, quite a little bit frustrated sometimes that I haven't got the show that yet and people actually haven't seen me go through the gears. I've been warming into fights and then all of a sudden, boom, the left hand lands and, and it's over. But I'm excited to actually go through the rounds, go through my gears and, and to be able to show people what I can actually do because there's a lot more in, in my armory than just a, just a straight left hand. And I think people are just just seeing that now and, and, and thinking that maybe that that's all I have. But... um. I've based myself for the last 20 years on skills and skills is what has got me to where I'm at. Thankfully, I've got that equaliser, if you want to call it, that dynamite in my left hand that can knock people out as well. But my game has been built on skills and I'm looking forward to going through the rounds and showing people what level I can actually operate at um, skill-wise as well. Well, speaking of skills, there's a gentleman who tweeted about you recently, Shakur Stevenson. Said something about sparring, what the the Irish giant he called you, which you are. I mean, pro, you're six two, yeah, and you're fighting one thirty five. Yeah, I love that. I mean, how great is that? It's just amazing. You yeah. know, I remember when I was first going into the gym. Uh, this my trainer Buddha. He, God rest his soul, cause he passed, but he was wonderful. He was like this guy's like Tommy Hearns. He just was like, you're my fighter. He grabbed me, you know, and he's just jab, jab. He was teaching yeah. me all this stuff, but jab was the main thing, right? He wanted me to fight tall. Um, and you know, sometimes I did, but I also like to go inside. Like me, like just like up. me. <laughs> you know, and, and even, you know, are you familiar with Sebastian Fundora? Yes. I love yes. Sebastian. Great, great guy. Yeah. I did a fight for him years ago in, in Uruguay. 
Uh, I first got to meet him and a lovely guy, but he's great to watch because mm -hmm. he's this enigma. I mean, he's, you know, obviously taller than both of us. He's yes. very, very Six, tall. four, five, but, maybe, man. He loves to mix it up on the inside. He's a real fighter. Yeah. And uh, he's, I, I, big shout out to Sebastian Fundor, the towering inferno, love him. But you are, are also kind of a giant for that weight class. Yeah. So you've had, and I think Shakur is probably one of the best on the planet right now, hands down. Agreed. I mean, he's just, Agreed. he's unreal. Fully agreed. Yeah. I really think he's just an extra special fighter. Yeah. Um, um, but 135, this landscape, talking about skills, we're not just talking skills, we're talking like skills. Mm -hmm. Okay, Haney, um, Lomachenko, Isak Cruz, Kambosis, Lemos, um, Abdulayev. There's so many good guys at 135. And you're right here. So, like, you feel like you can fit in there and mix up with any of these guys. 100%. I'm right at the door. And like I said to you about building my amateur career on skills, me and Shakur would have sparred back in Russia like 20, 14 year olds. So 12 years ago, 13 years ago, back in the, in hallways in, in Russia. And, and we would have mixed it up then. And I remember the Irish team and the American team, Shakur boxed at 48 kgs, I boxed at 50. And they were like having bets with each other about who would win in a fight and all this kind of stuff. And I, I believe I could mix it with him back then. Obviously, look, we haven't crossed paths ever since, but I remember at that time sparring with him and I obviously have massive belief in myself and did at that time as well and seeing him and going we're going to fight one day and we're going to make a lot of money fighting one day and I, I believe from that day I've seen all the American team um, I've seen Russians all over the world I've seen I've seen these guys and I believe from the day I first sparred Shakur that he was going to be special and he was the next the next in line to, to Mayweather the next great over in over in the States and uh I always believed that we'd fight, we'd share the ring one day. I said to him back then, we'll fight in the MGM Grand one day and we'll make a lot of money. And he said, yeah, let's do it. Um, and now look what the stars are aligning. And like I said, I'm a spiritual guy and uh, the stars are aligning and we're right on course to do that. And uh, not only Shakur, all of these other guys. Um, big lights, bright lights, um, big fights, bringing 10,000 Irish over to America, over to Madison Square Garden, already having thousands millions of irish americans over in new york and boston and chicago having them travel down to madison square garden and follow me and follow my journey fighting one of one of their own or an american guy and um, that's magic and and that's memories for life you know and that's what i want in my career i want the biggest nights i want the biggest tests i want the biggest names and obviously with all that comes big attention and big money as well and i'm in this game to make a lot of money and to to win a lot of titles as well and uh, to set myself up for life. So that all comes in the same package, you know, and uh, that's where I'm aiming. I've always big, been a big believer in myself and I'm aiming for the very top, so. Woo! I love everything you just said because I, I can visualize it too. And the Irish fans, there's nothing like them. You know, they come yeah. out, they support, it's unreal. I could be biased, but I always say we're the best in the world, but we travel all over the world for each other. Travel, and they, you guys get behind your charges big yeah, time. Big time. So do the Brits. So do so do a lot of a lot of different nationalities. But yeah. Irish are up there with anyone in the for world. sure. Who was your speaking of of Irish fighters? Who was your favorite Irish fighter growing up? Did you have one? I remember watching Bernard Dunn back in the tree arena and the point that was like I would have been it's fifteen years ago, so I would have been twelve year old kid at the time. Um watching Bernard Dunn, but I would have grown up. Idols as I was growing up through boxing years were Prince Nassim, Floyd Mayweather, Paul Williams mentioned tall fighters. Yeah. Paul the Punisher Williams, true like. Big shout out to Paul, man. Yeah. You know, he's, um, uh, he had also motorcycle accidents. Yeah. He, but, he uh, didn't uh, fare as, as lucky as I did. I was a big fan and uh, he used to throw like over a thousand punches in a fight. He was all action. Um, and that's kind of one of the guys who I based my style off as well. Um, but yeah, them three guys, big inspirations for me and I, I kind of took a lot from their three styles and mixed them into my my own little thing and see what see what I could do and uh yeah well he was the boogeyman at at, at, at middleweight for a long time until uh the knockout of the year with Sergio Martinez, Martinez. don't 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 fasten yourself after that Paul Williams. yeah yeah I don't like to watch that because I was <laughs> yeah, a huge fan and then that was no. unbelievable I'll never I remember like yesterday it was yeah. just like so shocking it was so shocking but I mean Talking about the landscape, going back just for a second, we were just talking about um, Shakur, obviously, and, and also you cannot forget about Devin Haney. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's this fight supposedly coming up with him and Lomachenko. Um, 
really exciting fight. How do you see that shaking out? And, you know, after that fight, it's very possible that those lightweight belts could fragment. Do you, is that where you see yourself coming in and possibly picking up a piece of the pie? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if Loma had got to Devin Haney maybe two years ago, it would have been a different fight. I think he's, Haney's a little bit fresher right now. Um, listen, time waits for Loma and Loma's getting a little bit older. Um, he's, he's a master of boxing and his skills are unbelievable, but I think that he's after slowing down a little bit and, and Haney will, will come out on top of that fight. Um, looks like he's going to move up to 140 and the belts are going to scatter there. Um, I'm fighting for a, a WBA Intercontinental tomorrow night, which is going to get me into the top 10 with the WBA. I think I'm sitting maybe 12 or 13 with them now, so it'll move me up a couple of spots and uh, put me right in line there for maybe an eliminator or maybe being in a mandatory spot when, uh, when Devin does decide to move up and vacate the belts and then get my hands on one of them belts and I'm right in there with all them guys then and that's when we're talking about them big fights in the next 12 months. Yeah, there's no doubt. It's a it's a great landscape uh, there. Let's talk just for a second about um, you went with Pete Taylor. You're training with Pete Taylor now. Um, and he, is he based in Bray? He's based in Coliseum Gym in Ballyfermot. Okay. Just outside... It's maybe 15 minutes away from Nice, from okay. where I live. Oh, it's nice and close. Yeah, it's close to me. I know Katie's from Bray. Katie's from Bray. We we, we started out in Bray, and then he's moved gyms now. Oh, you oh you did start out there. We started out in Bray. Okay. Yeah, and Katie's all amateur club. Did you you just have to travel out there? <laughs> yeah, from Nice to oh, from Nice to Bray. M50. M50. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. you're leaving. I used to leave Bray then at 5 p.m. and just hit uh, crunch time traffic, then rush hour traffic, and be sitting yeah. in there. But that was I spent two years doing that. Wow. Driving from Nice to Bray. That's cool. Um, hour and a half drive, and then maybe three hours back some days because you hit traffic. Um, but yeah, I've been with P five years since I turned professional, and um, I believe that he's he's brought me on leaps and bounds. He's showing me stuff now that like, obviously Katie started out with him, and looking where she's at, and he's showing me certain techniques and certain drills that that Katie based her style off, and I can see Katie doing now to this day, and things like that. I'm being taught now working for Katie, and um. It just makes me believe in his in his coaching style a little bit more. I always say that from the day I first met Pete, we just we didn't make any agreement. We just said I'll go meet him for a coffee, do some pads, see how things go. And from the moment I met him, his coaching style suited my boxing style, and but it's worse than my boxing style suits his coaching style. And he's he says sometimes that he had this thing with Katie, and he believes he has it with me as well. He thinks of a certain shot that might work in a fight, and he's about to say it, and all of a sudden it will land, and he'll go. We've got like a, a kind of a Great communication there, yeah, yeah. And I put massive trust in him, so I know whatever he's calling, he can. He's got an eye for the sport, and he's got massive boxing knowledge. Um, I believe he's one of the best in the world. So when he tells me to do something, I listen and I do it. And every time I do it, it works. So it builds that trust more and more, and builds that relationship more and more. And uh, yeah, he's been a massive part of my career and my journey. And well, by the way, we're talking about Pete Taylor, people out there, Katie Taylor's father. Um, so Pete just recently, we just saw each other the other day. And by the way, I want to have Pete on this podcast soon because I'm, you know, big fan of Pete. Um, but someone nicked his uh, his watch the other day yeah. in Barcelona, and I guess he went after him, and he missed a stare, and he tore his two quad quads, boat, yeah, ruptured um, quad. So he's uh, he's in like these double casts, but he's moving around, and we wish him a speedy recovery. Um, now you've also added to your to your camp strength and conditioning as of mm. recently how what is that added how does that feel do you feel when did that start what are, what are the differences you're noticing i started strength and conditioning like going back probably 10 years maybe now i've been i've been in gyms doing strength and conditioning because like i said to you when i was growing up through the amateurs i had all these fantastic skills and stuff but i was quite lean and like i said admittedly quite weak and would have been called that as well and, and cut up chicken legs and like made fun of and stuff like that going through my teenage years. Um, so when I became an adult, it was a big thing for me to become strong. I wanted just, not only for boxing, but just for life in general, I, I want to become strong. And I, me and Niall always, my strength and conditioning coach, my, uh, my friend who runs a gym, we always make this joke about 
if there's a zombie apocalypse, who's going to be the last one standing? So that's why we're so fit. That's why we're so strong. <laughs> just in we, case. Just in case anything ever happens. But I always say, if, if it ever comes to last man standing on the on the earth, I want to be right up there with the with the top top of the top of the tree, you know. So uh, going back about yeah, maybe ten years we started off, but in the last three four years, I've really started noticing I'm gaining my man strength, I'm maturing into the weight a little bit more, and. Uh, I'm becoming really, really strong. Um, and that's where this this power is coming from. But we work everything as, I'm not just in the gym, I do outside of camp, I do these things that I call, like to call bro sessions where I can't do them in camp, I'm going to do bicep curls and chest press and all this. But we, we do everything sport specific when we're in camp. It's a lot of plyometrics and explosive power work, power development, um, and a lot of stuff that's geared towards boxing. But in the last three years, I'm really, really starting to feel like I'm growing into the weight and growing into, just growing into my frame and into my body and becoming a lot more stronger. And like I said, I was always kind of known as this really skillful guy, but now people are starting to fear me because of not only that skillful guy now, they're seeing all the power that I bring to the table and they actually haven't seen the skills yet. So when somebody, when I when I get to somebody who, who can take them, them shots and they force me to, go outside my comfort zone and start using my skills a little bit more. That's when you'll see actually, I think better performances from me. I love that. Let's talk, we've talked a lot of boxing, which is great. This is a boxing type yeah. of podcast, but can we talk a little bit more just on the personal side? Like who is Gary Cully? Like what, what do you like to do in your off time? What kind of music do you like? What kind of food do you like? You know, um, yeah. Well, what's going on with you personally? Life is pretty, uh, Give, give us a, a window into the life of Gary Cully, uh, who the guy is. Is it really just boxing? Is that? It's a big part of my life, yeah. And I, I don't really, I don't really take a break from it. I'll, 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 I've got a missus, I've got a, I've got a dog, and I've got a couple of close friends. And What's your dog's name? Caesar. He's a Rottweiler. He's two oh, years old now. Nice. He's a beast. <laughs> um, so he's great as well. Um, so it's basically just I do a lot of yoga. I started it initially. The goal was to be able to touch my toes for boxing, for flexibility, for mobility. Um, it's hot yoga that, I've, that I started doing in the infinity Bikram. and uh, kind of like Bikram, yeah. Um, it's in a heated room and I started maybe two years ago um, in a in a, a, a studio that sponsors me. Um, we used to go to the recovery room there and I said I'd jump in and try a yoga class and just fell in love with it because of the whole journey. When you start out on something new and you notice all these gains coming and um, like boxing, the point I'm at with boxing now, I'm at it so long where you're working six weeks to change 0.1%. You're working on little, small little gains, little bits of your technique, a certain feint, a certain slip, whatever it may be. Whereas when I joined yoga, I could see massive improvements in a small amount of time because it was something new for me. And I just fell in love with the journey then and certain poses and stuff. and they were really challenging to me and going, I can't do this one yet, right? Give it two weeks, I'm gonna challenge myself, I'm gonna be able to do this. And it's a lot for, for headspace and to switch off from boxing. And my girlfriend actually gives out to me quite a lot because I'll do two training sessions. I'll do my boxing in the morning, my conditioning in the evening, and then I'll go to yoga at 8 p.m. And she thinks that I'm training three times a day and I'm training too much and I'm working myself too hard, but it's for mental mental space for me. Um, yeah. It's uh it's time away from boxing and time to just think about yoga. So I'm very much committed to the goal that I'm after and I'm, I'm very switched on to boxing. And I'm from the moment I wake up in the morning till the moment I go to sleep, I'm pretty much thinking about it all the time. So it's good to be able to get the hour where I can switch off and think about a, a different pose that I can't do or something like that. So that's a big part of my life. I probably do maybe outside of camp, maybe four or five days a week, I'm going to yoga. And um, like I said to you, I do a lot of floats as well to, to get that that little space away from the busyness of the world, I suppose. Um, and then after that, I just like to spend time with my girlfriend. I like to spend time with my uh, with my dog and I'm with my close friends. Um, I took 10 days off after the last fight and I said, I do, I train really, really hard and I like to train every day. And people said to me, look, take a week off the gym. You don't need to be in the gym for a week. And it was so challenging for me. Um, but I try and explain it to people as if, if you're going down to the bar to meet your mates to watch the match and have a couple of points. That's me going to the gym because my best friend owns the gym and all my friends work in the gym. My girlfriend, I met her, brought her to the gym and now she works in the gym. So everybody who I spend my time with works in the gym. 
I like to look after myself. I like to train hard. I like to feel strong. So I want to spend my time in the gym. Um, I don't drink. Um, gave up drinking maybe a year and a half ago. Drank when I was 18, 19, going through adolescence and going through hard times and stuff, but never really enjoyed it. So um, stopped drinking. So I don't want to be out in the pub with my mates, with, with people that I'm not. I'm not enjoying my time. I want to go places where I'm enjoying my time. I'm with people who, who uplift me, who uh, who I feel good to be around and who are positive energy. And I feel like that's my close-knit group. That's my girlfriend. That's Bob's who's here with me taking photos. That's Noel who owns the gym. And that's my close friends, you know. So I like to just spend time with the ones that are close to me because, like I said, when I go into camp mode, I'm in camp mode and I'm, I'm focused on the job at hand. And I, I don't really... I feel sorry for my girlfriend a little bit because from four weeks out, I'm just so focused on on a fight, she doesn't get much time with me, like, you know, and I like to give back time, who's, Babs has travelled over here with me and took time away from work to take photos of me and to, to create content for me for the week, so I like to meet her for a coffee and go for lunch and give time back to her because she's put so much time into me. Um, same with Niall, who put so much time into me day in, day out. I like to go for food with him or just spend some time with him and, and give some time back because these guys all put so much time and effort and energy into me and I like to give it back to them then when I can, you know, so. I just want you guys, I hope to listen to some of the things that Gary just said. I mean, I love it because you have designed your life for success. And, you know, they say lay down with dogs, get up with fleas. Mm -hmm. And the, the converse is correct also. You you get in bed with the right people. 100%. It that You know, you surround yourself with the right people and it's good things. And for you, the gym is your enjoyment. Exactly. It is work, but it's also your enjoyment. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a fake, like, you know, you took 10 days away and you were itching to get back mm -hmm. and it just makes sense. And and there was something else you said that I really, really, really enjoyed. And I think it was very astute. And I've, I've dealt with this a lot um, in my therapy coming back from my accident. You said, you know, you make these small, like in the gym, you're, you're trying to get these like 0.1%, you know, in yoga, you felt all these huge gains yeah. because it was new to you. But in boxing, you know, you know so much. Mm -hmm. So you're working really hard for these very small, you know, like you said, you work on a faint or something like that. But that's a very deep thing. And I think, you know, it's a mindset, right? Like you have to really work work very hard for these very small gains at a certain point. You know, when I first was getting back on my feet, I would see these big gains. It was like, oh my God, this is great. Like I'm now doing this. But then yeah. once you hit a certain point, you're going to therapy and you're only seeing very small gains, but those are very important. Of course. And in sports, especially professional sports, boxing, basketball, football, whatever it is, that eight, the 16, 30 second, the millisecond makes all the difference. At the top elite level, that faint that I'm spending eight weeks to perfect it can, could be the one that wins me a world title. You, that, you're you know? exactly right. So, and, and that's and that's my point. That's why I love what you said mm -hmm. because the devil is in those little small details. Yep. And you're absolutely right. And and you do have the equalizer, but you got to set it up. Of course, right? exactly. And these guys at the top level know that equalizers there. They know that. And, and Correct. They're going to give you one, give you two. All right, let's set them up. Boom. They're trying the same thing as me yep. because... It's chess at the top level, you know? It, it's absolute physical chess, mm -hmm. 100%. You, you're very, very right. We talked about the physical. Let's talk a little bit because you talked that you said you're a very spiritual guy. And I know you you wear a lot of tattoos. Um, you got blessed right across your, your, your left hand. Yeah. That <laughs> you blessed some people with. Yes. Can we yeah. talk about some of the ink and what it means to you and your spirituality? Yeah. Um, the blessed, like I said, I feel like that is actually just coincidence that that's on the left hand and that's the one that's, <laughs> that, that's knocking people out. But um, I feel like, like I said to you, going through my childhood and I felt like I've been blessed and I've got a talent and I've been gifted with, with a certain talent and I'm, I'm born to be a star and to, to be at the top level of the sport and the, the, the thing that I love to do. So that's just that I feel blessed by, by God or by a, by a higher power to be be following my purpose in life, you know? Um again, that's that's God. Um a lot of a lot more of them are just I started when I was when I was like sixteen was yeah, what was your first tattoo? Fifteen, sixteen was my first tattoo on my back. I got it on a family holiday. Look at my mum, let me get one done, but I was going well, like well, what is it of? It's uh, crosses cross oh. with a with a, it's crazy now because 
I'm not the most religious person anymore, but when I was 14, 15, everybody who had a tattoo who boxed had praying hands and rosary beads. Only God can judge me. Yeah. And um, it was the two pack and it was cool at the time. So that's what I got at the time. I would never, I see people covering tattoos and stuff like that, but that was where I was at at that point in my life where um, that's what I wanted to get. So I would never cover one up because it, it, it tells part of my story, you know, and I can look through them. A lot of them were just like pieces of art, but also they're, I can tell where I'm at at that time in my life. Like, you know, I got this uh, when I was 17, 18, and it brings me back to a certain point in my life, same as this. I've got an alien on my knuckle as well, who uh, who got a little stripe, got a little scar when uh, my hand cut the other year, but I believe in, I'm, I'm, I'm into space and uh Let's talk about that, that, that gash on your hand just for a second, not mm -hmm. to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. I'm going to, because I want to talk about that gash, because that, that was a tough year for you. That was, what, 2019, yeah? Mm -hmm. You gashed your hand. First of all, how'd you do it? And second of all, how did you deal with it? Because I think you only had one fight that year. One fight, yeah. That's really tough, man. Then you had to come back, and basically you said signing with Matchroom kind of gave you more direction in direction. your career. Yeah, it was like every time I gained a little bit more of momentum something happened and it stopped that momentum either I was injured or something else happened so I felt like it was I was taking step ups I was always like I, I was 2-0 and o, speaking to my manager about getting me guys who were like 17 and 18 and 1 for titles and stuff like that I was always step me up quick step me up quick but every time I stepped up I felt like something else happened that's, that kind of put a stop to my career you know so the sign of match room gave me that structure where here's your three dates you're going to be fighting this day this day this day here's your plan it gave me it gave me direction in my career if this was yeah this happened back in 2019 my first or yeah first fight of that year i think and uh don't still still a mystery how it happened um just got out of out of the ring and everything was fine i won on a six rounds points decision but pete always says looking back on it now that my face went a little bit white maybe through five and six and I was wondering it was my first six rounder and I was wondering like I said to you I based myself on being very very well conditioned and I, I started getting tired in the fifth and the sixth round and I was kind of wondering are we doing everything wrong here or is is there something up am I sick is there something going on and then we took off the glove after the fight and obviously my hand was my the wrap was covered in blood and there was blood dripping to the floor and then I went into shock um, I went to Belfast A&E, got it stitched up and was out of the ring for quite some time then obviously um, rehabbing it and, and, and taking the right procedures that to make sure it didn't happen again, you know, but like I said, that, came, that, that happened, got back on the horse, had another fight, then something else happened, put a stop to the momentum I was gaining, I'd have a big win and then something happened and put a stop to that and then when I'm coming back, I'm just getting back on the horse and then something else happened. So match room, the match room deal was big for me that it gave me, it gave me direction. Also, I think it came at the right time. I was calling for it for maybe four or five years before that. Ever since I turned professional, I was calling for it, I wanted it, but the time that it's fallen that now with Katie coming back to Dublin and, and I, I've said to you again, like a, being spiritual and the stars aligning for me, like the exact time that I signed, it's it's time to come back to Dublin. It's time to come home. It's time to to fight at home and to be the one of the one of the ones to spearhead that and uh, having the relationship with Katie and with her dad and and being involved in all of this. It's it's special. It's magic. And I think when when Katie eventually decides to call it a day that I can take the throne from her, and um, I believe that she's the one that's spearheading everything at the moment and giving us the opportunities. And she has been for the last 10, 15 years. And when she eventually decides to call it a day that, that I can take the throne and I can be the next one to, to spearhead Irish combat sports, you know? Well, it's looking like we are headed to Dublin. And if you can get the business done tomorrow night, it's looking like you're going to be fighting back there. Because I know you fought in Belfast a lot, right? Before. Belfast, you like never felt professionally in Dublin, huh? No, no. And I'm from 15 minutes from Dublin. Dublin, Dublin is the closest city to me. Dublin's my home city. Yeah. Um, Ireland's quite small anyway, but Dublin is my, my closest city and it would be special for me to, to fight there. Like I said to you, going to the Point Depot to watch Bernard Dunn 15 years ago, that's the same arena that, that's being talked about. So it would be like complete full circle and it would be a dream come true for me. So uh, I believe that Wilfredo Flores, people are saying about getting distracted about what's in front of you, Dublin, all this thing, don't get distracted by Saturday, on, on Saturday night. Um, 
but I believe that he couldn't be in a worse position because you're dangling this car in front of me going, yeah, we've got this big, big show coming up back in your home city, huge fight, co-main to Katie Taylor, but you've got to get through this guy first. Well, trust me, I'm going to get through this guy because <laughs> nothing's going to stop me from uh, from fighting back in my home city and in front of my people. So um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm fully focused on the job on Saturday night, but of full confidence in myself. Every fight I go into, I expect to win. So no, no less on Saturday night. I expect to go in and win and uh, have a have a big, big homecoming then in, in May, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the stage is set. Two undefeated fighters tomorrow night at the Motor Point Arena in Nottingham. It's gonna be a banger. There's gonna be some some great fights tomorrow night. Yours definitely being one of them. Yeah. If if Wood Lara wasn't at the top of the bill, I would say this could be the fight of the night. Could steal the show. It's hard to see a fight beating Wood Lara, but, yeah. but this is gonna be a, a very good fight also. For sure. And I'm really excited to see it. Um, you know, it if it's okay, I want to ask you some fan questions. Of course. But before we do that, I do I still feel I'm gonna just try to get in one more time because I feel like still want to know just a little bit more about like who you are like what's your favorite food what tv shows do you like who is gary cully right now you're a fighter but like what else do you do right now you're talking about food i've been on instagram for the past four <laughs> weeks just looking at food pages and going booking food just so you and... know everybody we were gonna do this uh what yesterday, yesterday, yesterday. before the way yeah, he's like no i could have named you off like <laughs> 50 places do it after the way in because then you know i'll be a nice guy yeah yeah even even now i'm like I could name you all fifty places that I've got that I've got uh, got planned for when we go home. But like I said, I'll, I'm I'm quite a simple guy. But I, I I enjoy to cook. I enjoy to do my do my own food. I prep my own food. I've got a a butcher's in in Nice that that um, supports me and, and sponsors me. And I like to I like shout out uh, Bergen Bergen Family Butchers in Nice. Yeah, um, shout out to them guys. Um, been supporting me for about a year now and. I like to cook. I like to prepare my own meals. Um, what What's your favorite meal, if you could? Uh, right now, Nando's. Nando's. Nando's, Nando's is number one. Nando's. Yeah, Nando's is number one for me. Um, I like Mexican food. I like Indian food. Um, you get Mexican food tomorrow night, huh? Yeah, for sure. Oh no, actually, Puerto, he's Puerto Rican. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm oh, trying, the food. I was trying food. to make up. Well, I probably I could have Mexican yeah, food tomorrow. Right like. <laughs> from Ponce, actually, Ponce is a great town. I've been to Ponce. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, really cool place. Um, Lee is trying to have Mexican food tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, like I said to you, I spend I spend a lot of my time in the gym. Um, I always joke. Do you watch any TV? I always what, joke, what do you, yeah. What do, you, what do you like? I always joke and I say that I'm quite a boring guy, but it, it, it's probably quite true. Like, I don't... I do, I'm into music. I'm into like American hip hop, big time, big into American hip hop. Little baby, little TJ, um, get like. Do you listen to that when you train? Yeah, and a lot of people, Kevin Gates also, and a lot of people are like, I see him with the, with the macho and feature the other day. People are saying to me like, you're acting as if, Nace is the ghetto because we call it the hood, but that's just all, what we've always called it as a joke. It's the hood in 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 Ireland in Kildare, whatever, but. People that you're at, it's it's a it's a suburb town. Don't get carried away with yourself. But like, from when I'm I've been this height, like listening to to Eminem, the Fifty Cent, growing up, like I've been big on that since I've been a kid. And these guys' music, I I can relate to this to the to the music and uh, it yeah it resonates with me a lot, you know. And I spend a lot of my time listening to it, and um, it shaped I think shaped my life. And I I listen to it when I'm in the gym. I listen to it training, and and it gives me a lot of motivation as well. I'm big big into it big into my music and um, like I said to you I'll spend a lot of time doing yoga next week Um I go away with my missus and and just just chill out and try and uh, I like nature like I like to I like to just just be still and to because boxing is a very especially in the last 12 months for me since signing with Macho and getting the putting in some big performances life is starting to get very very fast so the only we're talking about fighting tomorrow night and then fighting on May 20th, which is 12, 13 weeks away. So I'm only going to get one week, two weeks to, uh, before I'm back into that mode where I'm switching on again. I'm, I'm starting to, to get ready for a fight again. And when I go full into to fight camp, I'm all in. Like So yeah. the next two weeks will just be, like I said to you, giving, giving time back to the people who have put time into me and trying to 
to get some stillness in my life and to to just yeah. to, to just rebalance everything and uh, to get ready to go again because fight weeks are uh, they're very mentally difficult, they're physically difficult, and they're they're very men- uh, emotionally challenging as well. So I like to just take time to rebalance everything, give time back to my family, give time back to my friends, and my close ones, and get ready to go again. And probably when uh, when everything is said and done in five, six, seven years' time, I make enough money and I'm retired, then we can do this podcast again. I'll have a lot more different hobbies outside of boxing. Um, but right now I'm I'm full focus, laser focused on the goal ahead. Um, even when I do, like you said, I've set myself up for a successful life even when I do yoga yoga is a hobby of mine right now but it's also moving me closer to my goal floats are a hobby of mine they're also moving me closer to my goal so all of my hobbies you might think they're they're genuine hobbies to me but people think it's training people think when I go and see the sports I go I, go, I get massages weekly but it's it's for relaxation and to heal my body, but it's also toward the goal. Toward the goal, everything I do is do, towards this goal. Do you have a backup plan? What like what would you be doing if you weren't boxing? Uh, I think, like I said, we we call it the hood, but like the estate that I'm from in in Nice, it's like you're profiled already before you've done anything. So like this guy is from, or we we call it the hood. It's Sarto Road and. Um, you're not going to do anything in life, kind of, because you're from there. You know what I mean? It's 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 an area like that, and, um, a lot of council estates and stuff, or council houses, sorry, and stuff like that. But uh, a lot of my friends and and family and have fallen down the wrong path and got themselves into trouble and through uh, through alcohol, through drug addictions, through drug selling, through all of this kind of stuff. And I could have easily, I was in a position where. I was going through a lot with my family, with my mom, with my dad. Um, domestically, also, mom had cancer, dad had cancer, all within a, like a two, three, four year period when I was like 18, 19, just at that age that it was either choose this road or, or go down that road. And it could have went very wrong for me as well. And thankfully, I chose boxing and I chose to to put time into this and and to, to try my chances at this because if I had tried my chances at maybe the other options that I could have tried my chances that I could have been in a lot of trouble and um, yeah thankfully I put my time into this and, and I am where I am did you ever have like a a job like other jobs uh, like I've got I'm a qualified personal trainer okay um, Noel who owns the owns the gym in Nice has been a, a mentor of mine should I say from from when I've been like when I met him when I've been like 10, 12, 14 he's been been mentoring me and been been a a great role model for me since I've been growing up. So, um, spending time around him and spending time around his gym, I ended up doing a personal training course to to coach boxing to kids and to, to just to be insured and um, to do that. But I've fallen in love with with how to train and uh, nutrition, sleep, recovery, all of these kind of things. Sports psychology. I'm big on. I I do a lot of sports psychology. I work with a sports psychologist and. I'm big on the mental side of boxing and the mental side of sports as well. Um, so like I said to you, they're all moving me towards this goal, but they're also big hobbies of mine. And uh, probably if I didn't box, I could be a, I, I would be in Noel's gym doing something with, with Noel's gym in, in, in personal training or athlete development or something like that, you know? So um, this is Scott, our producer, oh, as you know. <laughs> and, he, and he's giving me the sick. It's your fault, Scott. Yeah. Cutting it short. But I always like to see him twitch, so I'm mm-hmm. I still because there's a couple more things I, I want to talk to you about before we go to the fan questions. Yeah, yeah. But we'll try to we'll try to wrap it up very quick. First of all, I I want to give a shout out to your lovely mom, and I hope she's doing okay. How's how's your mother doing? She's doing great. Um, she's flying over here in the morning. Wonderful. So, looking forward to seeing her. Um, flying over with my little sister. She's 12 too. My brother just arrived today. Um, we're a close family. She's got a partner now, a new partner. She's been with the last couple of years and. To see her happy after all the shit that she went through, um, it, it it's it's huge for me. It makes me very happy to see her happy because uh, obviously growing up by seeing what she went through and um, yeah, to see her happy is it's it's big for me as well. You know, she's she's eventually found somebody who uh, who treats her right and uh, yeah, it's big for me to to see her happy. I'm looking forward to seeing her tomorrow. We're a close family, and uh, she gets to see me perform tomorrow night. So, how proud of you is she? 
Yeah, really proud. Really <laughs> proud. Um, and how 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 does that make you feel? You just it's got to feel great. Yeah, and she's she's no like I said, Nice is a small town, and the last couple of fights, the matchroom deal, and all this, it's it's a big deal around the town, and it's a big deal around the county, and I'm I'm starting to feel it more around the country, even though it's getting it's getting bigger. And she's known as she's she, she's been walking around the town. There's Gary Cully's mom, like, and she's loving it too, like you know. Um, I actually sent her a funny text yesterday. She she said she was in the hairdressers and somebody was talking to her about the fight and she can't go anywhere without somebody mentioning the fight. And I said, yeah, we're big time now. Get used to it. Like so, Divas. it's cool to see she's <laughs> she's she's believed in me ever since I've I've said I had this dream and I'm going to do this. And she's always told me that it, it, it's achievable, you know. And she was the one that got me on to like I said the the spiritual path, should I say of. She's been big into the the law of attraction, the secret, and all of this, and she introduced me to that. And uh, I've got her to to thank for a lot of my success. So, uh, are you? It seems like you're kind of imposing your work ethic and your beliefs into your little sister. Is that is that happening? Try my best. You're trying. Um, does, does she take it or? She, I'm probably a little bit hard and harsh sometimes. Where my <laughs> mom's like, Gary, she's twelve. Yeah, you know, she's twelve. Yeah, and I'm like. <laughs> She's upstairs on her phone. And I'm like, is she gonna start sports? Start learning What's music? What's choice? she gonna do? What's like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, right. what are you gonna do with your life? And she's like, Gary, she's twelve. Like, but <laughs> I try my best. I'm probably a little bit hard, um, but it's out of a place of love. I just want what's best for her. And and I've seen it work with me that if you have a belief in something and you love something and you want to do something, that you can do it. So yep. I, I'm big on trying to instill that in her. Um, I get that. It takes a lot of work and you really need to have a passion for something, but I'd love for her to, to find a passion and to find something that she loves. She was learning guitar for a while and I'm like, put 10 hours a week into guitar. But I'm big on the 10,000 hour rule. I've read the book Bounce, Matthew Said, and it's practice really does make, we won't say perfect, but... Um, a lot better. Yes, exactly. And the more and more hours you put into it, I'm not the same fire I was now as I was two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, the more and more time you spend perfecting your craft, the better you'll get it. And I just want to, her to find a craft that she loves as early as possible in her life so she can put lots of time into it and that she can do something that she loves for the rest of her life as well, you know? I love it. Let me, uh, would you be okay to answer a couple of fan Let's questions? Let's do it, yeah. Let's see what we got here. <clears throat> oh, oh, here we go. All right. Irish eye... Irish Eyes underscore 19 asks, we need to get a show next St. Patrick's Day at home. If you was headlining, who would you pick to be on your undercard? Paul Ryan. He's a guy I spar in, uh, in the gym. He's 5-0. He works extremely hard. He's very, very dedicated and very, very committed. And I believe his talent is world class. But he's just not got his opportunities yet. And I'm, I'm at him every week because, like I said to you, this matchroom deal with me has been going back ever since I since I turned professional. And uh, his break hasn't came yet, but I stuck it, I stuck my time out and it doesn't happen overnight. And I keep telling him, well, I'm, at him I'm at him once a week going, Paul, yep. you got through this week, you're frustrated, you've not got a fight day, but stick with it, I promise. You'll get your opportunity. And when you get your opportunity, you'll take it with both hands and I believe you will. Um, so I'd love to see him getting his opportunity um, and and showing the world what he can do. So hopefully if, if Taylor Serrano um, has any undercard slots, he gets on that as well. But um, I believe his time is coming. He's 5-0 with four knockouts fighting next week. Um, and then he's got another fight two, three weeks later. So he's getting active and he's getting some opportunities now, which is great to see. Um, I'd love to have Thomas Carty and, and Johnny Fisher fight on the undercard. Oh, I just want to see that. I just want to see that point. Well, that's probably a, not because then I wouldn't get to see it. You know, it's a great tarot. Yeah. Oh man, I like that fight. Um, I like that. Keevan Hines in a big fight, obviously. Um, he's Irish, and uh, yeah, and I, I, I'd like to see any good, any guys who are committed and and talented Irish young prospects coming through, getting their chance because. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work to, to get your chance and get on the big stage and I, I'd like to give opportunities to the ones that are coming through because it takes that sometimes to, to get your opportunity to put in a big performance. That's what I've seen happen with me. I got my opportunity, put in a big performance and now things are starting to move for me. So I'd, I'd love to do that for, for the, the next generation and, and to, to spearhead Irish boxing coming back to Dublin but also to be one of the guys who 
inspires the next generation coming up too. Yeah, for sure. You know who I talked to this week? It's funny. I just I just remember this, but as you're talking about that, I talked with John Duddy, um, and he was big in New York. Yeah, huge in America. He was big. Yeah. Man. I mean, the Garden. When John Duddy fought, it was just. And that guy is salt of the earth. Yeah, he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's wonderful. living in America now. Yeah, yeah, he's still yeah, in New York. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. He was, uh, he was doing some acting, and I think he still is. But cool, uh, great cool. guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember growing up watching John Duddy on Hunky Dory Fight Nights. Oh man, he was like, and always in an entertaining fight, always oh, in a war. Absolutely. Um, yeah, entertaining, fun fighter. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, let's see what else we got here. Two more. Pete Saunders asks. Have you seen any of Tommy McCarthy's stand-up comedy? If so, is it funny? <laughs> By the way, big big shout out to Tommy McCarthy. He's, <laughs> he's calling himself Tommy Diamante. He's ringing out. Is he? Yeah. Yes, and he's great. I love him. So I love Tommy McCarthy. Man, like yes. I just I'm like the fan. I haven't seen the stand-up, but I've seen a little bit of his of his comp of being an, a compare. He's great, man. Tommy McCarthy, big fan of him. I just like to second that and say I love Tommy McCarthy too. Tommy's the man. Um, <laughs> That's a love great Tommy, question. love his energy. Um, haven't heard any of his stand-up comedy yet, but I've got a taster of it being around the gym and training with him. He's uh, Tommy's a great guy. He's a man of many talents. So he is. I uh, I, I expect none none less than than what he's done in boxing to do in, in stand-up comedy if he puts his time and energy and effort into that. Um, he'll definitely be successful at it. I think he'll be a success at whatever he wants to do. And he's also got a beautiful family. So yeah, big yeah. shout out to, to Tommy McCarthy. Okay. At Feared Polo asks, is Ben Davison mad to cherry pick Mauricio Lara for Lee Wood this Saturday as a volunteer defense? I think Lee believes in himself. Lee wanted to fight. Ben believes in Lee. Ben wanted to fight. Like... You might have every fan right now, if I was announced to fight Shakur Stevens in the morning, calling Pete mad or calling Niall mad for for choosing that fight for me. But I believe in myself and my team believes in me. And sometimes that's what it takes to be great. You need to, you need to take the, this opposition and, and the ones that people think maybe that you're not going to win. So um, I've got massive respect for Lee for taking that fight. And uh, like I said, he believes in himself big time. And Ben and his team obviously believe in him too. And uh, I expect him to go out and do the business on Saturday night. So, uh, no, I don't think he's won. Well, I can't wait to see that fight. And I really can't wait to see your fight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Gary the Diva Cully, thank you so much for joining David, us, man. That was great, bro. Appreciate that one. I really appreciate you. Um, undefeated, lightweight. Um, he's fighting Wilfredo Flores tomorrow night. We're here in Nottingham, England. So tune in on the zone and next week we'll be back remotely. Uh, we're gonna have another great show for you. Thanks for all the support and ladies and gentlemen, the diva Gary Cully. Tune in guys.